Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. It is Monday, May 16th, 2022. Always 1776.com, a free site. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just admit something that's deeply personal at the beginning of this video. I do true crime videos here on YouTube. And a lot of the times when I'm out with friends or when I'm out with family, I'll start talking about different cases. The people around me are completely tired of me talking about the Kennedy assassination. Understand, John F. Kennedy really was a revolutionary president. It doesn't quite come through today, but there was a time where a president who was developing things like the Peace Corps, who talked of peace, who talked of civil rights, who met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the White House, who met with organizers of the March on Washington in 1963. There's a time in American history where that kind of man was revolutionary. Right? We know he was a war hero. He had a certain gravitas and credibility that came with having fought for the country. We know that he was a guy who, when needed, could be the man behind opposing the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? We know he had a backbone. We also know he had some personal failings. He was a philanderer. But make no mistake, the guy was a leader. The Civil Rights Act of 63 that was unsuccessful, right, did not make it through Congress, was actually authored from the executive branch of government, right? Kennedy's office authored the Civil Rights Act of 1963. To understand the man, you need to look at that act, right? The, the Civil Rights Act of 64 is heavily based on what Kennedy himself unsuccessfully presented in 1963. Now, I believe the people behind, and I use the word people, not only the assassination of President Kennedy, but the cover-up made certain mistakes. Now, let me pause here and pivot for a moment. You know, real life has different genders. Real life has different ethnicities and different races. We understand that. In 1963, the power structure was such that when we started talking about representative government and the people on the Warren Commission who were supposed to represent all of us, somehow gender ethnicity and race left the room, right? There are no women on the Warren Commission. There are no people of color on the Warren Commission. The bias is stunning because of the actual people who witnessed the events that the Warren Commission was investigating. So let's talk about the fifth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, right, on the day of the assassination. Let's talk about the fourth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Let's talk about the big mistake Oswald makes 
And let's talk about the most important witness from that day who completely discredits the idea that Oswald was the gunman. First, on the fifth floor, folks, it's brothers. It's African Americans, people with this color skin. Bonnie Ray Williams, Harold Norman, James Jarman, right? Three black guys. As you hear the facts here, what I want you to do is to ask yourself a real disturbing question. Did the people who put this assassination together intend to frame one man or was there a group out there that they thought, okay, if we pull this off, the suspects are going to be outsiders. Either a Lee Harvey Oswald, a guy who defected to Russia at one point, right? Or someone who was called the N-word at the time by their boss, Roy Truly. Roy Truly referred to African-Americans by the N-word in private. Here were three of his employees, all African-American. Are you sure they were trying to pin this on Oswald? Now, on the fourth floor, here's where gender plays a role. I'm going to name three people who are as important as anyone is in terms of having firsthand knowledge of what happened the day Kennedy got assassinated. They're women. Sandra Stiles, the person she runs down the stairs with, 15 seconds after hearing the shots, Victoria Adams, and their immediate superior, Dorothy Garner. Now, folks, you don't understand the assassination unless you understand these three women. There's another woman, by the way, on that fourth floor, Elsie Dornan who filmed the motorcade, didn't know how to use her camera, did not get the assassination. Now, history is focused on Elsie Dornan because of her film. I want you to focus on the other three women. You should ask yourself another question. With three key women being witnesses, how could there not be a female member on the Warren Commission? Wouldn't you want someone on the Warren Commission who could talk to female witnesses and get information and come across as having the same kind of experiences? Understanding what was being said, being able to relate better. Well, understand, and we have it on film. Right after the shooting takes place, Roy Truly, right, the employer at the Texas School Book Depository, and Marion Baker, a policeman run into the Texas School Book Depository. Right, Baker says, hey, you know, it took us a minute and a half to run into Lee Harvey Oswald on the second floor. Right, a minute and a half to two minutes. Now, what I want people to realize is that the Warren Commission narrative is that Oswald on the sixth floor, above the fifth floor with Bonnie Ray Williams, Harold Norman, and James Jarman, and above the fourth floor with Sandra Stiles, Victoria Adams, and Dorothy Gardner. Right? Oswald fires the shots. 
if you believe the Warren Commission, using a Mannlicher Carcano rifle that he ordered through the mail. Then he hides the gun. He then proceeds to go down the staircase, makes it to the second floor. Now understand, the door to the second floor, lunch area, with a soda vending machine, has a dampener on it. In other words, the door closes slowly, right? Doesn't close that fast. We're to believe that Oswald gets off the shots, is able to go from the sixth floor to the second floor in a minute and a half to two minutes, and then is seen by Roy Truly and Marion Baker, who are going the other direction. They run in the building, right? They're caught on tape, running into the building. And then they go up the stairs. Now understand the way the stairs were. The stairs in this old building would empty onto the floor. So people on the floor would actually see you as you went up or down the stairs, right? You would go down a flight, you would then be on a floor, then you would have to pivot to go down the next flight. Now just understand that if there is anybody on the stairs during the relevant time period, they would be able to tell whether Oswald came down that flight of stairs from the sixth to the second floor to be seen on the second floor 90 seconds to 120 seconds after the assassination. Anybody on the stairs wrecks the story. Well, just understand, 15 seconds after the assassination, you have two women, not one, two, Victoria Adams and Sandra Stiles, who believe they've just heard gunshots. They want to get downstairs to find out what happened. So they get up and they go to the staircase. There's a third person who sees them. Dorothy Garner. She goes to the staircase with them. Now, if you believe these, not one or two, but if you believe these three women, they're over by the staircase 15 to 30 seconds after the fatal headshot. Now, understand, Stiles and Adams go downstairs. They never see Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Oswald's supposed to be coming from the sixth floor, right? Oswald is supposed to be coming down the stairs. Nobody sees or hears Lee Harvey Oswald. Now understand, I get that some people might think, well, maybe these women were on the staircase before Oswald got to the staircase. Here's the catch. This is why Dorothy Gardner is the most important witness from the day of the murder. Understand, Gardner doesn't go down the stairs. She stays on the fourth floor. She is there in the stairwell, the area where you're seeing people come up and down the stairs. By the way, these documents were classified. They're featured in Oliver Stone's masterpiece on the JFK assassination that was recently released. His appendum to his movie. Understand, Garner is there when 
Truly and Marion Baker arrive at the fourth floor. She's there. Just understand, by the time Truly and Baker arrive at the fourth floor, they had already run into Lee Harvey Oswald on the second floor. In other words, Gardner is in the stairwell area of the fourth floor during the time period in which Lee Harvey Oswald is supposed to have, according to the Warren Commission, gone from the sixth floor to the second floor down that staircase. She never sees him. He never went down that staircase. Folks, let's make this simple. If Lee Harvey Oswald did not go down that staircase, he's not the gunman who killed the president. There simply is no time. He's seen 90 seconds, 90 to 120 seconds after the assassination on the second floor by Dallas police officer Marion Baker and by his boss, Roy Truly, who knows him. There's no mistake in identity. He couldn't be on the second floor. In that soda machine room, if he took another staircase, there simply is no time. So let's talk about what's on the sixth floor. And I need for people to recognize that no one at Ruth Payne's house ever saw Lee Harvey Oswald's Manlicker Carcano. Right, Ruth Payne flatly says she didn't know it was there. It was supposed to be kept in the garage, right? But it was supposed to be covered up. We're speculating now on whether it was there in the garage. But what I want folks to understand is that the specifications on the rifle that Lee Harvey Oswald bought through the mail don't match that Manlicker Carcano. The rifle he bought is supposed to have been shorter than the Manlicker Carcano found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Let's go one step further. The Manlicker Carcano found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Isn't the Manlicker Carcano that's found in the photographs taken by Oswald's wife that he's holding up a gun in? Right? The series of photographs where Oswald's wedding ring mysteriously changes hands. The series of photographs where Oswald mysteriously gives a signed photo to George's de Morinchild, who, if you believe the folklore, was a part of the U.S. intelligence community, was much older than Oswald. Right? Just to understand that the Manlicker Carcano rifle Oswald is holding in those Marina Oswald photos has certain attachments by which you attach the sling to the rifle. And just to understand, those attachments are different in the Manlicker Carcano that's found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. So let's get disturbing here. Let's talk about a mistake Oswald made because history has been assuming 
that the person they were going to frame was the defector, was Lee Harvey Oswald, right? It's clear to me that the actual assassin goes a different way. Understand, the FBI expert who looked at the Mandelker Carcano rifle could not find a single fingerprint on it could not find a palm print on it. Look it up. Folks, that rifle, and of course, no one sees Oswald wearing gloves. That rifle, according to the first expert who's supposed to have been prominent, didn't have any prints on it. It's later it's later that a different expert supposedly finds a palm print on that rifle, supposedly finds print material. Right, folks? Here's the question. The President of the United States has just been killed. Let's say you know that Oswald has a Mandelker Carcano rifle. <clears throat> Let's say you're unsure of whether Oswald can produce it. Right? He's separated from his wife. He's living in a boarding house. If you wanted to pin the assassination of the president, on someone who was a bit of an outsider. Isn't it enough that you just have some outsider types, folks at 63, right? People, this is still before the Civil Rights Act of 64. African-Americans are still fighting for the right to vote. Right? You're dealing with poll taxes. You're dealing with grandfather clauses. Right? You're dealing with party machinery where African Americans don't even have a candidate to vote for. Is it possible that had Oswald stayed after the assassination, had he not been the one employee to leave, is it possible that this assassination may have been blamed on Bonnie Ray Williams had been working at the Texas School Book Depository for less than three months? People barely knew him, right? Just like people in the building barely knew Lee Harvey Oswald. Isn't it possible that this could have been blamed on Harold Norman? or James Jarman, right? Understand, Bonnie Ray Williams is supposed to have been on the sixth floor shortly before the murder, right? He's supposed to have eaten chicken, we know this, for lunch that day. Would it surprise you to learn that when they found the sniper's nest, the cops actually found chicken bones near the sniper's nest. Now, it just so happened that these three men were together. Right? Are you sure that whoever planned this murder didn't have some variability in it? Where they thought, okay, we have a guy. Lee Harvey Oswald, who's a defector, if he can't succinctly and bluntly account for his whereabouts, people will suspect that he did the crime. Don't you think there are other chapters to the story? Don't you think they're thinking of themselves, Bonnie Ray Williams, what is he, 20 or so, young guy, 
might have eaten his lunch up by the fifth or sixth floors on the building. Right? Harold Norman, James Jarman, they're African American. How hard would it be to paint one of them as an angry black man? Right? Let's think it through. Understand, the assumption in history has always been that either Lee Harvey Oswald did it or that people in the shadows set this up so it looked like Lee Harvey Oswald did it. Are you sure about that? Did they even need to define the patsy with specificity. Let's say, as it turned out, Bonnie Ray Williams, Harold Norman, and James Jarman were all together, which they were, on the fifth floor. Right? Let's say that, in fact, we got a better film that shows that, in fact, Oswald is prayer men. Right, was with some Texas school book depository employees watching the motorcade down front. Or let's say there were other people around. Keep in mind, when Oswald gets arrested, they talk to him. And he actually talks about two black guys who pass through the lunchroom while he's there, moments before the assassination. He couldn't have known that information had he instead been up on the sixth floor. Is it possible that the Texas School Book Depository, in addition to its sight lines, was chosen in part because strangers were in the building that day, right? Floor and other parts were being installed on the sixth floor that day. There were some people there who others didn't know that day, right? Is it possible that they picked that location without putting all their eggs in the Lee Harvey Oswald basket, thinking, you know what, this is a diverse building with Oswald and other outsiders, people who were not, let's be kind here, politically favored at the time. It's 1963. All we have to do is pull off this assassination using a Manlika Carcano rifle on the sixth floor and then let the chips fall where they may. If Oswald can prove that this isn't the Manlika Carcano he had, a lot of people are still going to doubt it because what was he doing down in Mexico City? Where was he getting his money from that he leaves Marina that morning? Right? He was already on FBI radar. He had an FBI agent who he was in regular contact with, James Hosty, who, of course, flushed the last note he got from Oswald down the toilet. Do your research. But let's say the public didn't buy the Oswald angle because Oswald's a new father. Maybe he does get photographed as the motorcade passes. Don't you have a lot of other people in the building? It just happened these three black guys are together on the fifth floor. Had the assassination happened just 20 minutes earlier, Bonnie Ray Williams was by himself on the sixth floor. But here's the key to the whole thing. Understand, because Dorothy Garner is by their stairwell on the fourth floor and sees Truly and Baker and never sees Lee Harvey Oswald, we know Oswald did not come down that staircase moments after 
the President of the United States was shot to death. Right? We know that, by the way, the documents concerning Dorothy Garner were classified for decades. Why was that so? How could they have been classified longer than the Church Committee investigation in the 1970s? Right? And so just to understand, Dorothy Gardner, by herself, disproves the Warren Commission. Understand, she sees Sandra Stiles. She sees Victoria Adams. They see her. The women's version of events is corroborated by each of them. Right? And so, whoever shot, whoever shot John F. Kennedy left a different way, folks. The Warren Commission is simply incorrect. The timeline set forth in the Warren Commission report, they're incorrect. They fit a narrative that didn't happen that day. Also, neither Truly nor Baker saw the door slowly closing to the second floor, which is what they necessarily would have had to have seen if the door dampener operated like door dampeners do today. And Oswald just barely beats them to the second floor. But did not happen. Let me close by saying the rifle, the Manlika Carcano, is more than 40 inches long. Now, Buell Fraser, who drove Oswald to work, claims that the package that Oswald is carrying was shorter than that. But what I want people to understand is whoever organized this assassination made a mistake because they didn't realize that Buell Fraser's sister would also see Oswald that morning. Neither Buell Fraser nor his sister claims that the package Oswald was carrying was long enough to be a Manlicker Carcano. Understand the sloppiness, too. It's not just the absence of fingerprints, right? One of the premier fingerprint experts was given the gun and could not find a fingerprint or a palm print on it. That was the first conclusion. Right? Just understand that. But there's a bigger problem. The paper that the gun was supposed to be wrapped in doesn't make sense because there are no photos of the paper that were taken by the cops that day because the paper itself came from the Texas School Book Depository and it doesn't match the timeline because very few people in the building had access to the paper cutter. Oswald was not one of them. Right? So just recognize that the Kennedy assassination has holes. It might be more open-ended than we think. The idea might be, let's get Kennedy... We have this Manlicker Carcano rifle, but even if Oswald can prove it's not him, there are other people who are going to look awfully shady. Right? There are other people who aren't politically favored in these 1963 times who we could try to pin this on. Again, Bonnie Ray Williams wasn't there for more than three months. 
He's on the sixth floor by the sniper's nest. Just minutes before the President of the United States is assassinated. Right? Let me make another point too. Arnold Rowland claims he looked up at the building. He's with his wife. Right? She recalls him looking up at the building. They talk about what he sees. He sees a white guy and he sees a black guy on the sixth floor. Right, folks, is it possible that whoever put this together had a multiracial team that would lend itself to mistaken identities? Right, Roland can't say whether the white guy was Lee Harvey Oswald, right, the black guy, Bonnie Ray Williams, but he sees a white guy and a black guy. I would encourage people to Google his comments, right? So had Oswald not left, let's say had somebody who was watching the motorcade, and keep in mind, to this day, no one can tell us with certainty who Prayer Man was. Please Google Prayer Man. If someone could have said, yeah, Oswald was with me watching the motorcade, right? If some cameraman, and the cameras picked up a lot, folks, Billy Lovelady, Buell Fraser, a lot of people, had the cameraman picked up Oswald watching the motorcade, where it would have been impossible for him to then get to the sixth floor to get off the shots. Don't you think that the people who pull this off had a plan B, right? Had some strange black guy up on the sixth floor with a white guy. Let's, let's confuse it. What race was the shooter? Don't you think they had enough to cast suspicion on other workers or to even leave it open-ended? Let me close with this. I've been careful here to say whoever planned this assassination. What I need for people to understand is that with all due respect to Lamar Waldron, who wrote a great book, his theory is that the mob did this. Right? He is quoting people like Carlos Mar Marcello and others, right? Just understand that the mob couldn't have done this alone if they did it. Right? They couldn't have done it alone because the mob would not have had the ability to fake the autopsy, right? There's several healthcare professionals at Parkland who talk about the back of the president's head being blown off. Understand the Secret Service member, I believe his name is Clint something, who runs up to the car as the shots are being fired, openly talks about the back of the president's head being blown off. That's not the autopsy. We now know that Jack Ruby was an FBI informant, right? We know that. Well, just to understand, while the mob may have worked with the FBI and other government agencies, in doing certain things, right? Maybe anti-Castro activities. Maybe things like this. Just to understand, at some point, the mob loses efficacy. When the president is in federal custody, right? After leaving Dallas, which should never have happened. 
right? That's not the mob, folks. That's people higher up the food chain. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Let me also point out that it's curious that Lee Harvey Oswald would pose with the Mandlicker Carcana and then would decide that of all the people in the world, he would give one of the pictures to an engineer who was rumored to be a part of the intelligence community, right? Is it possible that Lee Harvey Oswald was actually a patriot working with the intelligence community who then got betrayed in the worst way possible? Let me hear your thoughts. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Right, my YouTube account is Esquire777. Also, look for more podcasts like this on thewirecrime.blog. Thanks for stopping by.